All right, everybody, we're going to get started a little early. Travis has uh, informed me that he's got a lot of material and uh, we want to get through as much as possible. So this is Travis Reisner. He's going to talk to us about um, some of the new things in, in uh, coming along in Python. Thank you, Daniel. So um, we are going to roll through this new stuff that's in Python 3.6 and 3.7. There is interesting things that are in 3.8, but you'll have to go to somebody else's talk for that, okay? So uh, you will find that uh, I make a very poor attempt at humor, so uh, whether you learn something or not, you're going to have a wonderful time. So. <laughs> I notice there's a few familiar faces in here. This is actually a talk that I gave at the monthly Python group uh, a few months ago. Um, I will mention that we do have a monthly group here in town for those of you that are local. And we also have a weekly dojo that's at the uh, Columbus Brewing Company out on Dublin Road. And that's every week on Thursday night from 6 o'clock on. Pardon, John? Smokehouse Brewing. Smokehouse Brewing, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I cl guess Columbus Brewing is another place in Columbus that. If you show up there, they won't know what you're talking about when you say Python. So they'll think you're looking for snakes. So, Okay, so I called this talk, uh, this is not your teacher's Python, because if you learned some Python some time ago, you, they will not have covered this. And so uh, the approach that I'm taking is we're going to, this will be a lecture. I will go through and rapidly touch on these various things. If you find something that you find interesting, go look it up, or um, I'll probably be out in the hallway afterwards if you want to ask me questions. Okay? So, um, here we go. Okay, this presentation will be out on GitHub or GitLab at that location, uh, Deep Punster. Uh, so, Python improvements. So, Python versions. Python version 3.5 came out in September. Um, in December was of 2016 was 3.6. And then 3.7 came out in June of last year. And there will be a Python 3.8 coming out in October of this year. Okay, the beta is available. You can play with it. Python 3.8 has got lots of interesting things in it, that, um, but I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, so we are running Python 3.7.4 in this presentation. So just to let you know. So one of the things is they've added a need ignore option in Python. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I get my keys straight here one of these days. Okay, there's an ignore option that in enums now that allows you to actually create a whole potload of variables that have the same name, but you tell, you're telling Python to ignore that name. So then this way, this actually creates a list. So if we take and run this, we see that we get a name error. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but we'll keep going. Uh, oh, it's trying to type in there. Okay, let me escape from here. There we go, okay? And the dates you never want to forget. So uh, the first one is, I call it speed dating. So what it amounts to is that you now have the ability in Python to take an ISO formatted date as a string and have it convert that into a fully uh, date time format file uh, string for or value for you. So you don't have to keep fussing around with a bunch of different libraries in order to beat something into an actual date format. Okay, so um, okay, so um, you can now fold your dates, but don't spindle or mutilate them. If that goes back far enough, you might remember that phrase. Um, basically, what the folding date does, and we'll see here, and it came out in three six. This allows you to know which one of the three to four hours when you do a switch between uh, daylight savings and standard. 
so that you know whether you're in that first hour or whether you're in the second hour. It will actually tell you which one. There's a, a, a value it will tell you, okay? Um, I will leave that demo to yourself. You can have fun playing with that, so, okay? All righty, another thing too is if your dates weren't tiny enough or your times, now you can take a measure time in nanoseconds, okay? So if we run this, we can see that that's how many nanoseconds it was since the beginning of today. So, all right. So, um, people were complaining they didn't have enough uh, resolution in their times. So, Python took care of that for you. I don't know if we'll get into picoseconds in another year or two, but we'll see. So, yeah, that'll be three nine. So, okay. The uh, Features in 3.8 are already fixed. I can't add it, so. Okay, now, this is one of the things that if you've not got into yet, f-strings are a great thing that I like to uh, tout and use myself, okay? So the original c-string, you had the percent sign business, but you had to list uh, percent s, and then you had to list another percent with the, the variable afterwards where you wanted that stuck in the uh, kind of formatting you had control over was probably not as good as you wanted. With the newer version of Python, they allowed for the format on the end, and you have the uh, curly braces where you want the variable to show. You can also put a whole bunch of stuff in those curly braces saying that, oh, I want this to be uh, dash, you know, and all the values to precede with a dash. I want to have it formatted to so many places. I want to deal with it this way or that way. There's lots and lots of formatting options, more than I can possibly remember. So the third thing, though, is the F string, where you can just say that you want to, here, where your variable is, you just put the variable in the, the curly braces, and you're done. You don't have to say dot .format or any more parentheses and stuff like this. It just puts it there for you, okay? So the only time where you might not want to use it is if you have the ability in the older format way of listing the variable once and then having it pull the variable out and put it in the string multiple times. Or if you want to reorder the variable and put the list of names on the end and you want to take and have the third one listed first, something like that, okay? That's about the only time I can think of that it would be worthwhile to have the f-strings that way. So let's see what happens when we, oh, sorry. Um, see what happens when I uh, try to run this. That's what I was afraid of, okay? I went back and redid these slides, but this is one I missed where so that I could get all the stuff on the bottom up where you could read it. So you can see they all put out much the same string except for the last two prints, which you can't see. But they do the same thing, but it's a lot easier, a lot of less typing with the F strings. Okay? So. Okay, now. For those of you that don't like typing a nine-digit number with no separators in it, we now have an underscore operator. So you can take and specify your value, a literal, with underscores in it, as we can see with the first line there, astronomical equals one billion, okay? You can see it print out if by using the See, the first time we print it out, we just print it out as is. So it really is just a pure number in terms of the way that Python internally treats it. But if you want to print it with underscores, then all you need to do is to, in that nice F string there, after the colon, you put an underscore. And so it says, oh, I want underscores for every 30 to indicate all of the, each of the three locations. Okay? So... Um, dictionaries now retain insertion value. They changed the fundamental code underlying creating dictionaries. So now the new default behavior is, is that it will keep the same order that you had it in when you put it in. 
Okay, so we look at this, we can see that uh, here we put the stuff, we added stuff into the dictionary where you had closet, drawer, and bookcase. So, um, so I put the uh, ties, oh, okay, those are the keys, the ties, the socks, the books, and so on, okay? And then you can pull out the stuff. You can use pretty print to make this look a lot nicer. I don't know if you've ever used that particular library. That's one that's kind of handy for making stuff look nicer without having to spend a lot of time setting stuff up. So pretty print, though, was prior to 3.6, so... Okay. Now, if we look at this key list here, we will see that the keys are listed by default in that order. But if you take and sort it, then you can sort them values out and have it come out in alphabetical order if you wish. Okay? So. I bet I skipped past something, didn't I? Wait a minute here. If I knew how to type. <laughs> okay, there's our key things, okay? So, something that new was some significant enhancement to the async I.O. They have added uh, async and await. Uh, that's somebody else's prop. I mean, somebody else's presentation to give you. So it would cover far more than I would have in this 45 minutes to talk about just the async and await stuff. Okay, but it's there. If that's something that you need or are interested in, you can take a look at it. There's a library called Curio, written by uh, somebody who has spoken here, uh, David Beasley. And uh, there's another one called Trio that's based on Curio. And I think there's probably two or three other libraries. Or you can go at it alone. Okay? So there's lots and lots there to look at. You know, you can take a pick with whatever you want. Okay. ASCII and you will receive. See, I told you there'd be a bunch of bad puns in here. So, okay. What they have added in 3.7 is an ASCII... Uh, is ASCII uh, method on strings so that now you can find out whether a string that has an emoji is contains all ASCII characters or not. Okay? Yeah, maybe you might use that six months from now. So. <laughs> or else you write your code so you can handle you to code regardless of what they throw at you. So. Okay? So... Uh, Pink Panther strikes again. I was dealing with this in terms of the old way of doing things when you wanted to talk about directories was you used the join uh, command to stick directories together. And so that worked. It's a little clumsy. Okay? And the new way of doing things that you can use the new path library the path library allows you to specify those things as being directories, and then you can simply put slashes in there between the directories, just like you would see in real world stuff, okay? And in fact, that does work in Windows where the slashes are, somebody fell over and made them all backwards, so. <laughs> Sorry, my biases are coming out again, so. so. Oh, I forgot to import the library up in the previous one. But anyway. Okay. So another area where they made some significant enhancements to 3.6 was they added much better hashing. I don't know if you're familiar, but the fact is that SHA-1 and SHA-2 have been cryptographically broken. Um, the uh, library MD5 has been cryptographically broken. So that somebody can take and do something or other where they can alter your file and still make it come up with the same MD5 as before. Okay? So NSA put out a contest, uh, I'm sorry, NIST, put out a contest for a new SHA algorithm. There was a bunch of contestants for it. The 
new one uses something called that was labeled then SHA-3. Okay. Now, what I will show you here is the original string, as you see, is this is a message. And when we hash that with, uh, what happened here? Uh, it's in, let's see what happens if I can get this to run. Oh, okay. All right, well, now I'll just tell you what happens here. When you do a SHA-3 against this message, it will come up with this yard-long string that's the hash for it. When you take and add a period on the end of that, saying this is a message period, if you look at the hash that results from that, over half of the hexadecimal digits will be different. So it will, even though you've, all you've done is add one more character on the end, you've not changed the rest of the message, that the hash will be drastically different which was the big advantage of SHA-3 over its competitors. Okay, so. Uh, oh, there you go. So you can see the original message. You can see the hash of it. Here is the uh, message with the period on it. And when we do the hash again, see how much different that is? Okay. So if you're not into security, yeah, this is a yawner, okay? But if you are, this is a significant improvement, okay? Uh, they also have added uh, scrypt, blame2, and shake, uh, but there's no rattle and roll involved. So uh, they are also cryptographic techniques or um, algorithms that are now available as part of the uh, cryptographic library in Python, okay? Or Python 3.7, I should say. All righty. So let's see what we got here now. Okay, it also includes Blowfish. Maybe you've heard of that technique. Uh, there's a couple of uh, password managers that are based on Blowfish for keeping the uh, stuff inside and keeping it safe. Okay. Uh, another thing they've added is make salt, which means, I don't know if you're familiar with the way that Unix used to take, and you had like a two salt character, and then it would take and use that salt in the, uh, when it created the hash that it put in the uh, slash etc slash password file, and that would be enough. Okay. Anymore now with the vast computing resources that are available to people and you can rent it or whatever, that hashing it once is not enough. So now you can tell it, I want to hash this thing 10,000 times. So it will crank through that 10,000 times before it gives you a hash back. So that means that the person who's trying to crack your password that's managed to download it offline will have to take that library and run through that 10,000 times on your, each of those passwords, which will slow them way down. Um, well, I won't get into all the other things, but so that's one of the things here. So you can see some of this stuff that's here. And this shows you that you can encrypt it, and you can encrypt it and decrypt it and get back your original value. Okay, how secretive can you be? I use this because there's a new library called Secrets that's available now in 3.6. Okay, and what I wanted to show you here is that you can take, and they have added Choice, which is one of the libraries that's in Secrets. So you just give it, here's my list. I want a random uh, value chosen for each, each time I call you. And this is a uh, cryptographically uh, secure choice. In other words, it's been tested and so on by experts far better than me that it will truly pick a random choice that's equally uh, likely that it'll pick any of the choices, okay? 
There's other uh, libraries in Secrets that are great for doing other parts if you want to do things. Uh, one of the things we'll see here is uh, if you need a uh, token, that Secrets can just provide you a token. And you can say, well, do I want a token that's just in bytes? Do I want it in hex? Do I want it to be URL safe? And oh, by the way, how many bytes do I want in that? Or how many characters do I want in it? Okay? How many people here have worked with uh, Django? So, you know that in Django, in the settings file, there's this place where you'd have the secret key? All you got to do is do a one liner to generate that now. So, so you can change that as often as you need to. So. All righty. So, Another thing that got added with 3.7 was something called data classes. All right. Again, the people at Python are looking at what we're doing, and they're saying, how can we eliminate or reduce the amount of boilerplate that you have to write? Okay. So what they did is they came up with this thing where you import uh, the data class, and it's a decorator. So now you specify a class, you specify the name of the class, you specify values or, or fields, if you will, like a uh, if this was a record or something or other. And so then you can specify all this stuff. And by the way, uh, we'll get into how you can add the uh, types to your variables and so on a little later, if we get that far. So all right, so we created a class called Queens, or an instance of it. and. Constantly getting name errors. That's stupid. You'd think I never did this before. So, <laughs> okay. What it will do is it will create a great deal of boilerplate code for you. Let me go back and show you what was here before. Whoops, too far. Okay. For each one of those fields that you have in your class, it will create a, a setter and a getter for it, if you're familiar with uh, the Java terminology. It will also create a uh, wrapper for this class that will contain all of those things. It will also create a way of creating a key that you can use as a key for a dictionary that you can write with this. It will create things where you can compare these guys. So for example, these happen to all be strings, but maybe you might have a uh, floating point or boolean or whatever. It will create the appropriate code so you can compare these things and check and see whether it's what you think it is or not. Okay? So, and then there's some other stuff that it does too. So, this may be something that you might want to look into where it would save you a lot of time writing code over and over and over and over. Okay? So. Alrighty, moving on to another area. In IP addresses, they've added some more code so you can determine subnets and supernets of IP, IPv4 or IPv6 IP addresses. So if we look at this one, that ran. So it tells you that, okay, here's an IP address. Is that a, subset, a subnet of another IP address? So if you're into this kind of thing with DevOps and stuff, this is very handy. If you're not, OK, I'll wake you up in a minute. So, <laughs> OK? So, and then if we look at this again, uh, we can see that it'll also tell you that something is a superset so, or supernet of another area. OK? So. Okay, so we are good. OS Walk and OS Scan were both available before 3.6 and 3.7, but they have added some things to it so that uh, they work more better. More better, right, good English. Uh, OS Walk was there from a long time ago. They added OS uh, Scander in 3.5, I think, and in Scander, what it does is that it walks down through a directory. It will 
not only pick up the name, which is what OSWALK would do, but it also picks up the attributes of the file. You know, is it, how long is it? You know, what is the permissions on it? Certain other things like that, that people typically wanted to know. With OSWALK, you would run it and say, okay, here's my file name. Then you had to go back and beat up the operating system to get the rest of this information. So with uh, Scander, you can take and get that information much more efficiently. So you make one pass at the OS, you've got all that stuff there for you to examine, okay? You can work with. So that was the difference there. So uh, there is a uh, demo available on GitHub, uh, on GitLab at this address. Again, Deep Punster is my moniker that I go with. So I think it's called Walk versus Scan. If you want to look into it more, uh, you can pull that down and play with it. So, Okay, so now we're getting into the uh, typing that's available now in 3.7, okay? What amounts to is that there was typing that was available a long time ago with 3.4, 3.3, maybe even 3.2, but that the folks at Python were very careful not to browbeat everybody into doing it one certain way. So what they've watched is that over time, they've seen how people want to do it, and so now they've started gradually adding this to the language. Now, I want to emphasize that when you add typing to your language, it is to help the IDEs and debuggers, and well, not the debuggers, but the stuff at compile time when you're writing the source code. At runtime, Python still does no type checking. So they didn't slow anything down by doing type checking when you run. It's just that this way, uh, you can have the IDE help you out when you're assigning a number to something that's only supposed to have a string or whatever. Okay? So we can look at some of this. Uh, the examples that you're gonna see come from this location out on read the docs. Um, it's a part of MyPy. And so you can look at this stuff in detail there if you wish. Okay. So for variables, we specify variables like, for example, in the first one we have an integer for age, uh, and then we can assign an integer to it. Uh, if you want to, like in the first example, we're just setting the uh, age to a one, which is what you did before. But by using the colon and a space and the type, then that tells your IDE what it is, what you expect that to have, okay? You can then, uh, down below, you, don't, you can specify it the other way, which is the way that it used to be done uh, with certain other popular ways of doing typing, where you would specify the type in a, uh, comment after the variable, okay? Problem is, is that's a little looser and it's easy to, uh, a little easier to get out of sync. So, okay. So you can use built-in types. So for example, you can use the integer, you can use float, you can use uh, Boolean, uh, strings, you can even use bytes, okay? So, for collections, you can specify how to do that, like with the list or the set, okay? And so on. If we move on, we see functions are set up this way, where you can specify uh, I thought it was in the thing. Uh, oh, it didn't. Put it there. Okay, so you can specify in the parameters what the value, what the types are for the values. Uh, but again, by using the colon space type syntax, um, if you do the colon space type syntax equals, then you can set default values for your parameters. Okay. So. Okay, if you want to get into complicated typing, there is. A libraries that are available or um, modules, whatever you want to call them, in typing library. 
So you can pull down union, where you can say that it's going to be something of either type. You can use the any, meaning that this may have any kind of type in it. So I'm specifically saying that I'm not setting this to a specific type. Okay. You can say that it's a list. Uh, the other one that's kind of nice is optional, which says I want this to be either a none or null, or I want it to be an integer, or I want it to be a string or whatever. So it's okay for it to be none, like for example, if you start out by saying that it's uh, equal to none, like I typically do. This way you can specify that um, the, what the other, that if it has a value, that value must be of a certain type. Okay? So. And they allow for duct typing. So you can get into all kinds of stuff like this, where you're saying that you're going to take and you're creating a function that's going to take the integers that's an iterable, and you're going to take and uh, put out a list that contains strings. Okay? You can do it however you want. Okay? Oh, by the way, this is the way that you specify the out top output type of a function. You, after the arrow where you indicate what's coming out, then you can indicate what type it is. So, let me put in. Okay? So, all righty. So, if you want to do classes, then here's how you would do it with classes. Um, you specify the stuff on the int statement uh, if you need to. Uh, and then on the instance statement, you can see where the method looks just like the functions that we saw earlier. Okay? All righty. Coroutines and async IO, they all can be typed uh, if you dive into that library, that world. Um, hopefully you survive. So. <laughs> okay? And then they have a couple of other mis miscellaneous types here that you can work with, where you can import match or any string or... I.O. So you can indicate that you're dealing with an I.O. file or whatever. Okay. So here are some tools. One of them is called monkey type. The other one is called pi annotate. The first one was written by Instagram and the second one was written by Dropbox. Okay. They are tools that will let you go through and take code that doesn't have types in it and it will add the typing to your code, okay? So, and I also think they'll come back and yell at you if they say, I can't figure this out. <laughs> so, so those are available also for you. Okay, now we get into some fun stuff that's not exactly part of 3.6 and 3.7, but since uh, I've got enough time, I'm gonna cover it anyway. How many have ever dealt with named tuples? Okay. Maybe you call them named tuples. I don't know. But I, that's what I started out calling until I got browbeat in the user group calling, oh, this is a tuple. So anyway. So we start out with the uh, un, unnamed tuple. And you can see that we can import. Oh, I need to do this so that the rest of the code will work. Hmm. Thought it worked. Well, we'll see. Okay, so the ordinary unnamed tuple looks like this, where A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals A comma B. How many knew that it doesn't need parentheses to make it a tuple? So, okay. If you've been bit by that, just by having the comma actually makes it the tuple. Okay? So, let's see. That should run. So, now we see that there's your tuple and that C contains a 1 and a 2 as the values in the tuple. Okay. So use of the name tuple, which it should be named, I forgot to change that to make sure that tuple was lowercase there. So now we've got a chicken and we've got three pieces to the chicken. We've got a left leg, a right leg, and a liver. Okay. So what we're going to do is in the rooster, we're going to say that the left leg is a red band, the right leg is a right blue band, and that the liver is tasty. So, so 
You may not agree with me, but I like tasty livers. <laughs> okay? So that's the way it works. Now, there's a couple other things that I, when I was doing some research here, I found out that they added something. In 3.7, they added something called uh, defaults, meaning that you can take and specify a default for some of the values in the tuple, and you don't have to specify that value every time. Okay. Also, that you can do the rename business, which means that if you notice, we have I'm saying that the name of the the pieces of the tuple is A B C D E F G H I A B C. Well, D E F is a reserved word, okay, and A B C I'm repeating. So then, uh, what the rename does is it says, okay, if you didn't come up with a valid name, I'm going to give it one. So, so for example, that did not fail uh, when we set up Wiley with eyes and tails, okay? And you can see also has nose and ears. So the defaults fill in for the last values of your tuple, okay? Now, what happens if you don't specify enough values, okay? So if we try this again, we see that we're gonna get bad assignment because that tuple required at least two values to be specified. That it only defaulted on the last two. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I went blown past it, but let me it would help if I hold down the shift key, not the space bar. Uh There we go, okay? What I wanted to show you was is that the first one is called ABC. The second one got underscore one because DEF is not a valid uh, value for a name. And then the fourth one got underscore three because it was duplicated from the first one that I specified, okay? So in other words, this will let your code run anyway, so. Okay, so we saw that. Now, unlike unnamed tuples, with named tuples, you can take and actually replace a value in the tuple. So change it. So the mantra that you told that once a tuple is created, it's always there forever. Now you can say, no, I don't want that. <laughs> I want something else. So, so we see that we set slyer equal to a different value for the GHI parameter, and now he has a back instead of a nose. Okay. Okay. So now the name tuple from typing is much better. It actually creates a full-blown class. You can specify each of the fields that you want in that tuple. You can specify what um, kind of what type that value of uh, that field should have and you can specify a default value for it if you wish okay so uh, this is probably not going to show up is it probably didn't okay so an example with defaults uh, and function oh that's the other thing that you can do that you couldn't see up there I'm sorry you can actually add a function to the tuple so that you can get a value out of it that you have to compute, okay? So we're gonna create another instance of this guy. And, okay. So there's the full class. Oh, here's another one where I put in the cooking time. So for example, based on how heavy the bird is that uh, we have a different amount of cooking time for it, okay? So when we move on here, we have a mallard that we set to a duck. When we run that, it comes back and gives me yet another name error, okay? Uh, oh, I know why, because let's see if I can do this correctly this time. 
I need to run this so that it actually creates the now if I take and run this again now it shows me that the mallard is a duck what its gender is how much how much it weighs and how long it'll take to cook it okay so if I put together another example I can say that this is a uh, buffalo head and that I've changed it so that the buffalo head is female or I'm sorry yeah and the sound is quack quack and how long it'll take to cook it right and then you didn't think the replace got left behind so you can come along and say I want the buffalo head servant to be the change the gender and I want to change the sound so when we run this one, now it says, the Bruffle head says, yes, of course. Uh, so, and by the way, Bruffle head is a valid duck. I did look it up. There's a Wikipedia article for you if you want to follow up on that. Okay, so I guess I've actually made it to the end without, what, two minutes left? So, uh, if you do have questions, uh, briefly, we'll take it till, till uh, 2.45, and then we'll move out so the next group can move in. So, okay, questions? Three, seven, three, yes, sir. Because the data class decorator doesn't have any restriction on changing the values. Okay, if I create an instance of a data class, then it's going to have whatever values I specify, and I can change those as many times as I want. I don't have to go through any kind of replace operator, that kind of thing. By the way, replace operator, I don't know if you noticed, had an underscore in front of it. So it's one of the rare exceptions where you can actually start something with an underscore and not get shot. <laughs> okay? So, all right. Yes, sir? What did I do use for the presentation itself? Okay, I'm using Jupyter with a library that's called RISE, R-I-S-E, okay? Um, RISE has got a lot of capabilities. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to figure all of them out, so. <laughs> all right, you're supposed to be able to put scroll bars in and all kinds of good stuff with RISE. Uh, it does allow you for putting the stuff up. So basically, it's a Jupyter notebook and you use RISE for the presentation. Okay? So, all right, well, thank you very much. I uh, hope you enjoy the conference. <laughs>